Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody from the Landing AI team. <clears throat> Thank you for joining our office hours hosted by Erica Gilbert. A little housekeeping, this is a recorded session and we will send follow-up emails uh, within 24 hours with over the session as well as an opportunity to speak with um, any one of our reps. We highly encourage questions and if you did get a survey, Thank you for completing that. And we will cover all use cases as much as we can for time allotted. Um, this will roughly be around a one, uh, 10 to 20 minute demo. And then we'll take live questions. Feel free to drop your questions in our Q&A section because we can capture those correctly. And feel free to raise your hand and we'll call on you if time permits. Again, thank you for joining. And Erica, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, so uh, great to, to be joined by a great group. And I did see some submissions come in before. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to address all questions. But as Adrian mentioned, we will do a little bit high level, some best practice recommendations, and then go straight, straight into a live demonstration. And actually it addresses, I believe, if I'm understanding correctly, the goal, uh, one of the questions that came in through the survey. So you'll actually get to see a model built and then um, inferencing done live direct on my mobile phone. And then, of course, any additional questions that you have, uh, again, it's encouraged to use the uh, uh, chat Q&A fe feature to submit those, um, especially as some of the type form submissions came in uh, sort of just before, so we weren't able to compile um, as, as much as we would have liked. But uh, just, just to kick things off here, um, we know that there are a lot of different components that are taken into consideration when you are considering uh, creating a vision uh, project and developing an application. Um, the, the computer vision AI deep learning piece is, is one overall part of the solution. So, of course, we, we wanted to give you some just high level um, ideas of the types of uh, questions you might be asking yourself as you're trying to outline uh, that project. And of course, you know, it's, it's always going to come down to the goals and what are success criteria. Uh, but importantly, you do want to think about what are you actually showing or training and teaching your AI um, and what are you expecting that AI to out, output? Um, and what does that output look like in your downstream systems and applications? So how are you going to manipulate that uh, to get the outcome ultimately that you need? Um, so it's important to think about these at the start of all of your uh, projects. If you have a great idea, you're walking around and you're like, oh, wouldn't it be great if there was an app that did this? Or, you know, you see a business process that could potentially uh, use the benefit of a, a camera to assist the human. Um, there's so much opportunity, but, you know, getting started, it's first just the basics of, of outlining. What am I showing my, my AI? to? What do I want it to understand? Is it a defect uh, in an image? Am I actually asking it to uh, count or identify and verify the number of screws that are in a, a car door. Um, you know, the sky is really the limit. If you could actually capture, uh, you know, those, your object of interest, your labels, your, your classes, your inputs really uh, visually. So, and can you, can you um, agree on it with uh, different subject matter experts and stakeholders that are part of the project? Those are important considerations. Um, we have a capability in the platform that actually allows you to see agreements uh, based on labels that your, you know, subject matter experts provide, what, you know, in data science land is called the ground truth. Um, and we also have the ability to create a guide. And this will help um, rule out areas where you may have to iterate to improve model performance later, because there's a lot of confusion around, you know, let's say as an example, you're uh, grading uh, cell phones damage as they come in and you know there's a lot of discrepancy about what qualifies as a b c or d so outlining what exactly that is in a guide 
as you're coming in and tra training your model is really going to increase the output ultimately um, that you receive uh, down the line and then ultimately that your cu customers or your business process uh, benefits from. And then just some of the questions to consider about, you know, what types of models will help you orient around, you know, are you counting and verifying? Um, do you need to know location information within the image? Um, those are all very important um, questions. So that's all really just on the, the, the side before you get to deploy, before you're actually ready to uh, take your model's output and then pass it into a downstream application. So this usually, um, you know, can be, depending upon the systems that you're working within, can be a longer part of the process. A lot of the times, though, and what we'll show today um, is if you're working with mobile application development, it could be super rapid. Um, but let's say, for example, you have to implement, you know, this system in, uh, you know, a manufacturing facility on a line, and you have to sort of work with your IT to take that model output and, uh, you know, hit a reject button um, and kick the product out. All of those things require effort to sort of organize and understand, you know, how landing um, lens is giving you output and then what ultimately uh, you're going to do with that, including understanding, you know, how fast you need to see the results. Um, you know, if you're doing a mobile application, um, is, does that inference time need to happen you know, really rapidly, or can you wait a second to see uh, that information? So all good questions to ask as you're outlining your overall uh, vision project. And just some guidelines to, because it can be kind of overwhelming, especially when you come into Landing Lens for the first time. There's a lot of capabilities that are very sophisticated uh, deep learning models. Um, and you may not know ultimately what, what type of project or model type to select. Um, and, you know, we have four different types today. Obviously, we'll eventually develop more. And then if you're working with our SDK, you can also leverage um, our OCR capability as well. But um, we have the ability to, to class, uh, classify. So classification models you can develop. Um, this is a whole scene, whole image analysis. So one image for um, one prediction output. Um, so given an example of, uh, you know, in this case, like we're looking at sort of the soldering here, this is good and sort of uh, not good. Um, ultimately, that's a very good sort of binary classification looking at the whole Im image um, here, um, but you can also add additional classes. So it, it can be more than just a two class system. So a lot of customers will actually start with uh, classifying for good, bad, depending on a wide variety of different use cases of what good, bad it might actually be. Um, and then over time, as they've developed and, and gathered more data, uh, then sort of fine tune uh, based on the different types of, of outputs from both good and bad. So you can imagine with sort of defects, then it's, it's all of the different defect types. And it might be that for those, then uh, you're actually develop, developing detection segmentation um, or leveraging visual prompting models, because then you're going to have location information um, for uh, those predictions that are output from the model. Um, so importantly, object detection is uh, sort of the bounding boxes. You, I'm sure I've seen them on CSI <laughs> uh, following people around, but uh, we have a lot of capabilities actually also in our SDK that allow you to do sort of counting, tracking, or parsing uh, video pipeline. I know there was a question that came in uh, about uh, live live video. Um, so I'll, I'll touch on that uh, briefly as well. And then of course there's segmentation. So it's important uh, consideration for selecting model types here. Segmentation um, is the most computationally intensive uh, model. Um, this will matter less, uh, you know, if you're using cloud inference um, because we handle sort of setting that up for you and, uh, you know, tr try to keep a very consistent inference uh, timing but it might take longer to train um, that model. And then especially if you have uh, more images and they're quite large, um, the labeling part for the training of the model, not just the physical, um, I press train and then my model runs through its uh, epic cycles uh, and starts to learn and understand the different labels that I've 
uh, highlighted on the page. So it, it can be uh, quite onerous. And usually then unless the, the use case really requires precise data, um, you'll see these a lot of times uh, used in sort of filtering and uh, image applications where you're sort of highlighting a very uh, precise area in a given image. And then of course we have visual prompting as well, which offers segmentation level uh, precision and predictions on images, but takes um, just a small set of inputs to label. So really uh, rapidly improving the amount of time you're spending um, in that uh, part of the overall process for uh, labeling for training. Um, but currently this is in a beta state. So we have a small image set, which makes sense uh, overall. So for training, there's a max of uh, 25, uh, though obviously you can use that to inference um, and currently only as, as leveraged um, in uh, the cloud. And so that's something also to consider um, there might be uh, for your ultimate goal and business process or application, you might need multiple models and you might need to sequence them together to take one output and apply uh, to a different scenario. Maybe your images are super gigantic um, or, you know, for example, maybe you are doing a car detector initially where you really want to focus uh, on the license plates. So uh, you might first uh well, actually, in that case, you would use an object detector, detector for the license plate and then use our uh, OCR capability to pull out that license plate information. Um, but just an example of how you might uh, sequence multiple models together. Um, and then again, thinking about the speed um, and you know whether you're going to be developing the, the infrastructure itself to deploy the model, um, if you're gonna be using our uh, inferencing uh, application on the edge uh, that has a UI that has an inspection sort of endpoint called landing edge, or um, or are you going to use a Docker container uh, to deploy right on a, a, jet, a Jetson? Um, so all great questions to ask and think about even before you've selected uh, your project or model type. But of course, we welcome you to come in and sort of uh, test and see uh, first because it can be so uh, fast to see your results. Um, and this is just an example of sort of the best practice coming out of that model selection process. So for, um, we have an example data set that's from uh, Kaggle that has metal casting. Um, so actually this is not the, the greatest size here. This is smaller than what we'd actually recommend to really capture uh, those uh, defects uh, in the metal, metal cast themselves but it is a very consistent position. And for the most part, the lighting um, and camera is, is pretty uh, pretty good. Actually could have a more all over sort of diffuse light to re reduce some of the glare points here, um, but it still gets at the point of all of those things are really important um, for your use case itself. So how are the images being acquired? Is it from a cell phone or is there a, fixtured sort of set place where that um, information is, is taken from, or is it from a publicly available, uh, you know, live cam? Um, and so then ultimately, how am I getting that training data into landing lens um, and then to use for training, but then also how am I considering using that for uh, predicting and inferencing as well? But for, for classification, you want good coverage and visualization. So this is just a random example pulled from Google on the right here, but these are the pouring the cast here. And obviously there's a lot more visual information and feature uh, information to learn. Um, and so that would not be a, a recommended way to go about trying to, to setting up images to solve that uh, challenge. Um, and that really shows the point quite clear here um, that the, of course, we offer a data centric platform that learns from a very limited set of data, unless you're uh, pursuing our LVM um, approach. Um, but here you can use a minimum of 10 examples uh, for every uh, class or label that you want the model to understand. But more is always uh, typically better unless you're adding bad data that's not 
uh, focused to exactly what your uh, label ultimately is and what you want the model to under understand. But on the right here, you can actually see uh, the model is starting to learn the features of these metal casts and what ultimately uh, we want the model to understand as defect. And it has a heat map of where it's focusing those features. So obviously in the top here, after 10 examples, it's a lot less um, you know, focused on background. It's, it's focused more here on the metal cast itself. Uh, but after 10 examples, it's, it's really not focused in on sort of the defect areas that we can visually see. Uh, but after 40 examples, we do see that attention uh, and focus on that feature of the defect. And so you can imagine this would apply across, you know, any number of use cases of what you're trying to teach your model. Um, and the more examples, the better it's able to uh, tune in uh, ultimately to that feature. And we also want to consider overall for our use cases and our models that we're developing in Landing Lens, um, how we're balancing that training data. Um, so for each label or class in the platform, um, we, we want to get as equal a dis distribution as possible uh, because we want the model to understand better what scratch versus hole is in our metal casting example. Um, so it, it can be challenging though to achieve that um, dependent upon you may have very rare uh, use cases, um, but you're, you're still going to try to do the best that you possibly can to get uh, that equal distribution um, where, where possible. And, you know, some, in some instances, leveraging sort of manufactured, sort of created or um, synthetic uh, data. So now we'll get to the exciting part here where we're going to walk through uh, uh, the ability to do mobile uh, inferencing. Um, and the use case we're going to look at today is actually set up with a very simple um, light box that I ordered for like $20 on Amazon. Um, I can share if it's helpful for folks. Um, but to, to just create sort of even illumination um, over uh, the model here. So we can see um, I'm in uh, landing lens, I've created uh, my model. In this case, I just, uh, when I came to the upload, I selected to um, load my images with already in folders. So they all had labels of ultimately what was uh, good versus a uh, defect. And we can see my distribution here. There's 30 uh, defective and 30 ultimately uh, that are good. So we have that equal distribution. Um, and now I can just hit the sort of fast button here to train the model. And all of those ML operations are happening behind the scenes from the platform. So you don't have to think about any of that with the GPU and uh, the, you know, the, the training cycles and, and learning that you'll see over time. Um, I didn't show loading because these are taken from a cell phone. So they're relatively uh, large, so they, they take just a little bit of time to load, um, but you'll see the platform as it goes through um, its training cycle here. Um, but I can forward, hit the fast button here, fast forward button, and show one um, that's already uh, defective. And for this limited uh, sample set, we're going to test 20% uh, of that uh, data um, in our, our media split distribution in dev. So those are where the metrics are, are uh, coming from. And we can always see what the model uh, identified correctly um, based on the label we ultimately gave the model. So that, that ground truth there. This is a pretty good understanding for a, a rapid model that you know took me five minutes uh, to take the photos and load um, into the, the platform here. So then ultimately what we can do is once that model is trained and it's still training here, 
you can see it's going through that learning cycle uh, now. So we want this to be as close to, to zero as possible so that it improves over each uh, epic. We can also uh, just show you a few things here in the platform. We can filter by our different labels that we provided and just see different representation here. So pretty wi very wide sample. So this, this model may not perform as well as I'd like in the wild. Um, and so we'll actually be able to test that. Um, you can see my cell phone here on the right here once this model's uh, finished. Uh, but different orientations of our adapters here um, in this case, defective also means that the adapter is not in view or in the appropriate sort of position. Uh, potentially, maybe there's a hand in place or there's multiple or it's laying down. Um, so actually, a huge variation in what defective actually means. So we'll, we'll see how this actually um, ultimately performs. Give it one more minute here, the refresh button. Let's see. Still training. So um, what I'll do is just uh, my just in case model that I already developed. Um, I wanted you to see the the first moment before you hit. Sorry. Um, well, I guess that you can see what that looks like before you hit. Uh, now I've already hit deployed and tested this um, on my my new new project that I created. Um, but if if you haven't done that yet, um, you can see that it'll showcase what the different options are for you know uh, using our infrastructure on the cloud, um, leveraging our landing edge application, uh, which has a free fourteen day trial. Um, or uh, leveraging a Docker container. Um, so all of the options available there. Um, in this case, I've already hit that uh, train button. So I'm just sort of waiting here, but I'll go and show what it looks like. So once the model's trained, you can review uh, the, the predictions here. You can take a look at the heat map. In this case, the model seems pretty focused on the adapters um, as to learn what ultimately good is. So that's a good signal given um, the amount of data, just 30 examples, um, but curious just to see what that might be for the defective ones. So here, um, the heat map, I think, is, is learning a lot more uh, area than just the adapter, which is good, but will probably require more examples um, overall to really focus in. Some of the defects are actually pretty uh, small in these examples. All great things to sort of think about and view and test as you're uh, iterating in the platform. Um, then actually what you can do um, is you'll see the first time you uh, create your uh, endpoint. Actually, we'll just create a new one here. Oops, if I can type today. And there's this option here to run mobile inference. Um, the first time you, you create an endpoint, it'll show up uh, to the right here and you'll just click that. Um, but then you just click, get the QR code. And now, as you can see on the right here, I have my phone and then I'm gonna leverage my camera. And now it's um, pulled up an inferencing uh, simple web, web page specific to my model and endpoint. Um, and I can choose to select a photo. And then I have my simple light box uh, set up. So I'm actually gonna take a video. 
or take a photo. And then here we want the camera sort of slightly zoomed in. Oh, I forgot to hit deploy. Of course. Um, deploy. Um, so we'll do this one more time. Always when you're doing stuff live, you forget. So now the model's running uh, inference there, and you see it's it's correctly identified that this is a, a defect. Um, so you can do other tests and see um, I just removed my uh, defect, and I'm going to zoom in and position. Oh, great. Yeah. Correctly identified as uh, good. So, you know, in a matter of you know, less than 30 minutes, I deployed a trained deep learning classification model uh, to, to the web. I have an uh, application inference point that I can uh, leverage. And, you know, if I'm working with different business units or folks that maybe have no familiarity with AI, and I wanna take some sample images um, and then show them live uh, in person, I can show them what, what is potentially possible um, and then think about how this ultimately would be deployed in a produ production scenario. So we really recommend this for um, sort of uh, rapid uh, prototyping and showcasing um, to get buy-in or, or just to understand, it, is it possible um, to, ultimately show and teach a model, whether it be segmentation, object detection, classification, um, and train on certain uh, imagery and see a result in real time. You know, I was, I was worried here that, you know, we don't actually have enough images yet of, to focus in on what, what's actually good in this adapter, because it's a relatively small area here. Um, so I was curious how well it would actually uh, perform. So I'm sort of sanity checking uh, the feasibility there. I see someone else uh, took a random uh, image and submitted it. That's very cool. Good, good on you. Um, and here we now see the images available um, that were inference. And the other benefit of the pl platform um, is that we can use these uh, to iterate on uh, the model. So I'm going to add these images back to uh, my build screen. Maybe they show a representation that I hadn't quite um, uh, labeled before. And I can sort of come in and we always want the human to really be in charge of uh, confirming uh, what the ground truth is. So we always show it as a prediction there until you verify um, and that's by design. So really having that human in the loop and then we can click our uh, train button again. And now to include that new data, we'll have a new uh, snapshot of all the data used in that process. So let's say we took 20 different new example images um, and it confused the model of what was good. Then we could actually, um, when it would complete, we could go back to that previous sort of moment in time um, and use that version uh, of the model overall. So that ability to have uh, that level of detail and understanding and be able to go back to different views of the model um, is really beneficial in that you don't have to have that ML uh, data science type architect experience uh, to, to be able ultimately to do that. But that's a high level there of what I wanted to show you, just really how rapid and fast it is um, to build these uh, models, either for use case sort of feasibility, rapid prototyping, or getting buy-in with um, your different project stakeholders. So I did uh, receive a question um, previous with the type form that was um, just asking about data um, for live uh, traffic 
uh, cameras because uh, they're exploring a use case around that. And um, Kaggle is a place that we use pretty regularly to find sort of publicly av available uh, data sets. So if, if you are not a member of Kaggle, I highly recommend uh, joining. Um, there's a lot of sort of CSV data um, in this community, but there's a lot of image data as well. Um, and a lot of it can be super valuable um, even if you're sort of exploring a use case and you're not sure what's possible and you haven't acquired any images yet, it's a great place to come um, to see. And a lot of times uh, data that's actually from .gov uh, websites will be aggregated and other uh, data scientists will have uh, done different uh, tests or experiments there. Um, but there are a lot of uh, cameras that are available from .gov uh, websites. Um, so I think then your uh, next steps would really be around sort of the software development piece of uh, taking that camera feed um, and pulling the image frames from it to use to train uh, the model. And our you know SDK does offer some examples um, on how um, to to parse uh, video. So I highly recommend you review that documentation. Um, and see, you know, if it's applicable, or I'm sure you might would have to make some uh, adjustments or augmentations uh, to that. Um, but but very well valuable. Our our goal is to continue to grow this library um, so that you know, as you're looking to parse your data either pre or post uh, model input or output, um, you have some examples so you don't have to reinvent sort of the software programming wheel. Uh, all of that pipeline and uh, connectivity uh, yourself. And then I'm going to take a look now at the chat as we're going over to sort of the Q&A. And as Adrian said, if you would like to ask your question live, feel free uh, to raise your hand. Uh, we have a question here. Oh, we have actually a few here there. Um, let me go ahead and cover that one. What are the max number of classes we can use in different model types? I actually don't know that offhand. So what I would do in this scenario, we have a great um, knowledge base here. Um, so I just search class limit. Um, I will find out and get back to you. I think usually there's not a, a, a sort of technical limit on the number of classes. It's sort of more on the use case and, you know, if you're detection or segmentation, um, how visually different are those classes? Because a lot of times where we see, um, you know, I've seen customers, you know, with 40 different classes for a classification project. Uh, but then in trying to select those different defect types, there's actually a lot of confusion on um, what the different classes are. Um, and they're not visually distinctive enough. So the model performance is pretty poor. Um, so I'll, I'll, get, I'll definitely get you the, the hard answer of, of if there is any technical upper limit. But I would ask the question more around how am I thinking about what I want from the model and how visually, like, will the model get very confused if, you know, I have a defect type as an example, that's a smear versus a, um, um, I mean, I can't think of another example, but if they're very similar, then the model might be confused and you might want to actually look at, um, other post-processing mechanisms to um, parse the output from that um, model. So as an example, then you might look at the overall size of the area. For example, if it's an object detection model to understand that perhaps it's, um, you know, this versus that um, or involving the human in, in that next step if um, they're, they're too visually uh, similar. And the, the benefit of the platform is it's really easy to sort of test that quickly um, so that 
you know, then you can do some iterations and really build a, a labeling guide for those that might be coming in on your team to help um, distinguish that in the future. So that was a lot <laughs> to, to not give you a, a full answer, but uh, we will uh, follow up on that. So thank you for that question. Uh, next question. Can, uh, give me one second here. Can weights of train model be exported and used elsewhere? So we offer the ability for enterprise customers to uh, download models. Um, this is, especially if you think about Docker type applications, um, sort of that portability. It does not include the specific weights of uh, the model. So it's, it's not like you could replicate uh, the training ultimately yourself, uh, but the package uh, is available to to use um, within our landing edge application or within our Docker container. Um, we're looking at uh, potentially including embedding information in the future um, to be available as part of sort of your overall understanding of the model uh, profile. But there is also uh, information um, and metadata about the, the model. Let me... I'm clicking too fast, um, where you can see if potentially you're doing uh, custom uh, trainings, you can see that uh, information overall. Um, and then of course, the data snapshot we also provide, um, and this can be downloaded as a CSV. Um, you can load this as a new model um, in this current project, or you can leverage this um, to actually create a, a new model in a, a new project. Um, and this is great because you could actually say, oh, well, I started thinking that classification was appropriate and really the model is, there's just too much noise and features for it to learn. So I need to go to uh, object detection um, and you can do that later. Your, any metadata or tags you may have uh, used, maybe you're gonna do custom uh, specific test splits um, you can bring that over. Obviously, then you have to put the labels, but um, just some information about the model data that you can leverage within the platform and then also uh, outside. We also offer the ability to download the Pascal VOC file. And we'll give it another minute or two for last minute questions. And just as a reminder, just to stay abreast of our upcoming events, <clears throat> sign up for a newsletter, uh, join our community. And in addition, always um, for those of you who already signed up for Landing Lens, we do um, offer our office hours pretty fre frequently. So just keep up to date on our, um, on our website. We'll continue to send reminders to everybody. And um, it looks like we're good at the questions. Erica, great job. Thank you for your great presentation. Everyone, thank you for joining yeah, thank us. Thank you, everyone. And we will be sending out follow-up emails with the recording uh, tomorrow morning. However, if you would like to reach out to us today, feel free to drop an email at, at sales at landing.ai. Thank you and follow us on LinkedIn. Have a great day.